Morning, Graham. Hey, good morning, Alex. How are you? Um, well, all right. So we are uh, we're going to give a couple minutes here for everybody to get on. Uh, just keep in mind this is being recorded um, so that we can uh, share this information um, later. For those that are in the crowd, we are if you if you want to ask a question, uh, we are going to uh, we are going to bring you in on as, as a panelist. Certainly, you can keep your video off if you wish, um, but we want to just ha have that uh, a little bit more informal uh, interaction. So uh, once Graham um, Petto, who is our uh, planner from Topology, goes over sort of an initial presentation, we'll uh, open it up to Q&A to those that are out in the public. Uh, but we will bring you in as a panelist so we can have that, again, that, that, that more sort of uh, in, informal inter interaction, face-to-face -face interaction uh, on this uh, virtual platform. So uh, just wanted to give everybody a fair warning and a heads up. So when, when you do raise your hand, uh, make sure that if you want your video off, that it's off um, or that you're prepared to be on, on camera. We'll just give it another minute, Graham, and then we'll get started. Sounds good. All right, Graham, why don't you go ahead and get started? As I said, this is being recorded, so we'll be sure to uh, share this appropriately uh, uh, once, once we're complete. Certainly. So uh, good morning, Alex. Good morning, everybody uh, who's here in attendance with us. Um, first, I just want to thank um, the roughly 15 or so participants that we had on Tuesday evening at our first roundtable. Um, the feedback that we received was excellent um, and really kind of informed and guided a lot of the adjustments that we have made in the intervening period since Tuesday evening. Uh, and I'm happy to report that we were able to incorporate a lot of the changes that were requested. Um, I think, in fact, all of them, and I'll review those here uh, this, this morning in our presentation. Um, so you should be seeing on the screen now, I've shared over uh, a, a short presentation. Um, this will kind of go through a full summary of all the proposed overlay zones, um, and uh, we'll also summarize the, the modifications that we've made uh, so far since uh, Tuesday. Uh, Alex, you can see the screen, correct? Yep. Okay, great. Um, all right. So, okay, so first, just a general context overview we're going to talk about this morning. Um, then I want to summarize what we heard on Tuesday, um, and then I'm going to go into the review of each of the ordinance amendments. Um, so to refresh, uh, for those that may be new participating this morning, um, why are we here? What's going on? Um, so this is, we are discussing uh, zoning modifications and, over, and the incorporation of additional requirements in zone districts pursuant to the township's uh, settlement agreement with the Fair Share Housing Center that was, that was uh, settled last August. Um, settlement term number nine of the agreement, which is shown here on the screen and highlighted in yellow, uh, stipulates the um, settled and agreed to modifications to the zone districts listed herein uh, regarding uh, proposed residential density requirements within those zone districts. Um, so as, as I noted here on the slide, this is not really eligible to be modified uh, nor changed. Um, so what we're trying to do is incorporate these uh, in a best practice format um, to ensure respect of the uh, existing Milner Township community and also to ensure compliance with the settlement agreement terms as well. Um, so what we've heard so far, so I wanted to provide a little bit of a summary of what we heard and, uh, and it was the feedback that we heard uh, from residents at our round table just earlier this week on Tuesday evening um, in the council in the committee room uh, at the uh, at town hall. Um, so first we talked a lot uh, extensively about the B2 zone um, and we heard some discussion about evaluating uh, a reduction of the front yard setback that was proposed in the ordinance uh, for the B2 zone uh, to match the existing building line that's along Morris Turnpike in the adjacent zone districts. Um, it was also requested that we um, look to maintain the existing permitted height for developments that do not contain residential units, um, and also to review permitted building coverage um, to see if there was a, a way that we could 
modify the building coverage requirement to ensure uh, development that would be uh, better in scale uh, and appropriateness uh, to, to the re uh, adjacent uh, residential areas. Uh, on the proposed buffer requirements, the buffer ordinance amendments, um, we heard that uh, comments that we should consider a minimum planting size uh, to ensure height and effective screening uh, from residential, adjacent residential properties of these proposed developments. Uh, and I'll go through that. Um, and then it was also requested that we look at um, and provide a sample site development, um, as well as the, the calculations that uh, you know, brought us to these uh, quantifications. So we, can, we have prepared that as well, and I'm ready to share that with you all this morning. Um, so review of the ordinance amendments in total that we that we have prepared for the township um, to execute and uh, demonstrate compliance with the settlement agreement. First is um, we are proposing some amendments to the buffer ordinance. The township has an existing uh, supplementary regulation in the zone district code uh, that stipulates uh, very strong buffer requirements to separate um, non residential development from adjacent residential uh, zones and uses. Um, we've supplemented that code to. Um, ensure that there is further protection from multifamily housing developments and also mixed use developments. And I'll talk through those in a second. Um, and then the zone districts that we have proposed modifications for include the R1, the CMO, uh, a new district called the RMF AH5, which is the Canoover Country Club site, the B4 and the B2 zone. Uh, and again, all of these are the districts that are listed within the settlement agreement as well. So getting right into the buffer ordinance amendments uh, that we have prepared and incorporated into the drafts that have been posted online and also now since modified to incorporate the feedback that we heard on Tuesday. Um, the buffer ordinance amendment amends the existing buffer requirements, as I mentioned, this is an existing requirement in the, in the zoning ordinance uh, to now require buffer from multifamily housing development and mixed use developments as well. Uh, it requires that the buffer uh, will be uh, must be provided when abutting any residential zone. And we've also included it to say even any residential use, so uh, one or two family property in particular. Um, and this is because there may be some adjacent properties that aren't in a residential zone, but they're currently being used as such. Um, we wanted to ensure that there was protection for those properties as well. Um, we've also incorporated updates and enhancements to the landscape buffer design. Um, we're requiring that landscaping be adjacent to the residential properties or zones. Um, and in, in this way, um, what, we're, what we've done is we've required that the, any fencing that's part of this screening area uh, be pulled off the property line and the intervening space between the fence and the property line be landscaped. Um, this is to ensure that adjacent one or two family residential properties um, are looking at vegetated screening and not a, a fresh new white vinyl fence <laughs> that may be disruptive to their rear yard area. Um, this will ensure that you know you have that protected landscape buffer uh, adjacent to your property rather than that new fence. Um, we've also uh, made modifications to increase uh, the landscaping requirements for smaller buffer areas uh, and to ensure um, that taller uh, plants uh, will you know be required. Uh, and when I say taller, I mean taller at mature height, not at planting height. Um, we want to ensure that um, plants do have a success rate uh, within the required buffer area and typically planting smaller size vegetation um, has a better success rate than planting larger size vegetation at the time of planting. Um, next, we'll be moving into discussing the OR1 zone. So the OR1 zone um, is the site of the uh, Hilton Short Hills uh, across from the Short Hills Mall. I have it outlined here uh, in red on the map as shown here. Uh, this, this OR1 zone is applicable only to this property. Um, and we've amended the ordinance uh, for uh, this zone district uh, to permit multifamily housing developments on this property. Uh, it establishes the re maximum residential density of 20 units per acre as stipulated in the settlement agreement, um, and also expands the list of permitted accessory uses to incorporate anticipated developments. Um, and by accessory uses, I mean uh, things like electric vehicle charging stations or uh, accessory parking for residential uh, developments, those types of things. Uh, next is the CMO zone, uh, which is shown here on the screen. Uh, this is uh, at the southern end of Main Street um, and is in the purple area shown here outlined in red. Um, and here within the CMO zone, um, you know, there's a, a variety of permitted um, industrial warehouse uses, commercial uses in this zone district existing. Um, we've added the following permitted uses, mixed multifamily housing developments and mixed use developments. Um, in addition, we have also stipulated that um, the mixing of these uses with multifamily housing can only be in certain fashion. So you don't want to uh, mix an ambulatory emergency facility with a multifamily <laughs> housing development. So we've been sensitive to, to consider uh, compatibility of housing with uh, existing uses that are permitted in the CMO zone. Uh, the settlement agreement, again, establishes a maximum residential density of 18 units per acre in this area. Um, and again, we've expanded that list of permitted accessory uses to incorporate uh, anticipated developments. 
Uh, next is the RMF AH5 zone. Uh, this is the site of the Canoeber Country Club presently. Um, and this zone, uh, we, you know, we have to kind of establish full new development parameters within the zone here. Um, so this will establish a new zone district to regulate the 129 acre Canoeber Country Club. Um, and the ordinance will permit single family, two family attached and apartment residential developments all at a maximum density of just eight units per acre. Given the size of this site, um, the settlement agreement uh, stipulates that the density here obviously must be, must be much lower uh, than, the air, than the other areas. Um, we've incorporated bulk standards that are consistent with the existing R7 and R8 districts uh, here in the township. Um, so we wanna ensure that we you know, respect existing zone requirements um, and have incorporated those here. And we've also provided some additional requirements um, that regulate site design, driveway uh, arrangement and management, and also subdivision uh, techniques for you know, establishing any new subdivisions within the community here uh, at the Canoeburg site. Uh, the B4 zone, uh, so this is largely the downtown area of Milburn. Um, all the parcels outlined in red or highlighted in red uh, are inclusive in the B4 zone district. Um, so the, we've clarified the uh, ordinance amendments for the B4 zone um, to more clearly permit mixed use developments uh, and combination of permitted uses. Um, we have permitted a uh, ground floor residential space, um, but not along any street facing facade. So um, side facades or at the rear of a building can be an amenity space, community room, lobby area, those types of things uh, are now permitted in the first floor, but we want to ensure a vibrant and active downtown retail environment. So um, we don't want necessarily apartments fronting on, uh, you know, or, or residential sp uh, living space um, at that first floor level. Um, it establishes a maximum residential density of 40 units per acre, which is, again is consistent with the settlement agreement um, and requires screening of residential amenity spaces um, from any other adjacent properties. Um, and then we do have other minor bulk standard amendments, um, and then we've expanded the list of permitted accessory uses to incorporate anticipated developments as well. One additional modification that we've made in the B4 zone that I did want to touch upon is um, unique standards for properties adjacent to the Milburn train station. Um, so here along Essex Street, as shown on this smaller map, uh, between Lackawanna Plaza, Holmes Street, and around Essex, um, down to Milburn Avenue, uh, properties outlined in red, um, we're proposing a, an increased maximum height uh, from three stories to four stories, and a maximum height of 48 feet. I provide an asterisk here to note that um, this is actually a recommendation in the land use plan element of the, of the Township Master Plan, the 2018 Master Plan Reexamination and Update, uh, adopted on December 28, adopted December 2018, as noted on page 45 and in matrix M3 of the plan document says, consider raising the height limit above three stories in targeted locations to allow multifamily residential mixed use buildings within close proximity to the Milburn train station. Um, we have stipulated an additional requirement, which is to um, require a fourth story step back from the front facade at this level. Um, and that front setback shall be 15 feet. So you can have three stories that go up at the front at the front yard setback line, then that fourth story will have to be set back 15 feet. Um, we conducted a, a, a large geometric <laughs> analysis to uh, calculate this. Um, and the 15 foot figure is because Essex Street, the right of way is roughly 60 feet wide. So if you're standing on the opposite sidewalk and look up at the building, you will not be able to see that fourth story. It will be set back um, so the building will remain visible as a three-story building in this area. We've also stipulated that the minimum lot area to develop anything at, at this height um, needs to be at least three quarters of an acre. So a lot of assemblage would be required in this location as well. Uh, next uh, is the B2 zone. And this is uh, where we'll kind of round out the discussion as there was most commentary on the B2 zone. Now the B2 zone is um, the most extensive area that abuts uh, residential uses. Um, so again, as I mentioned at the top, those buffer requirements will be required here and in all other um, adjacent zones as we've already talked through. Um, but as you can see here on this up this image in the upper left, um, this is the B2 zone along Morris Turnpike. We have two sections of B2 zone. We have the upper section of Morris Turnpike and then the lower section. Um, and here you can see behind this light uh, orange area is the R6 zone, which is pretty extensively abutting uh, the B2 zone. So, um, you know, the, the buffer requirement will be required along the rear and side for all of these areas. And we do have a model site development plan that I'll talk through some of the details on that. Again, we also have another area of B2 zone uh, here along Milburn Avenue. Um, this is the Annie Says property here. And so extending eastward on Milburn Avenue, we have two areas of uh, B2 zone. And it's important to note that while this appears to be abutting uh, residential zones, the New Jersey Transit right-of-way rail line uh, actually is at the rear of these properties. So there is an effective 
uh, physical barrier between uh, you know, these zone districts and the adjacent residential to the rear. So uh, in the B2 zone, as we've discussed, uh, it will permit multifamily and mixed use developments. Uh, it establishes maximum permitted densities of 18 units per acre along Morris Turnpike and 40 units per acre along Milburn Avenue. We've amended the bulk standards to accommodate the anticipated development. And we've also uh, amended the bulk standards to ensure that they're pulled further away from residential properties. Um, we've prohibited front yard parking and required a 30 foot building line for linear, linear podium parking. Um, meaning that you know you have to have at least 30 feet of building at the first floor before you can have any parking beneath the building at the rear. Um, and so to accommodate the required intensity and respect the existing conditions in each of these areas of the B2 zone, um, the ordinance has established three separate um, bulk, three separate sets of bulk standards for each of these areas of the B2 zone as I talked through. Um, so the first is the Morris Turnpike, the upper portion of Morris Turnpike, uh, which will be developed at 18 units per acre. In this location, uh, we're, we have uh, amended this to now reduce the maximum height down to 40 feet or three stories, um, which can be accommodated at 18 units per acre. We've also reduced the front yard setback down to just 25 feet, pulling those buildings much closer to Morris Turnpike to allow for greater separation uh, and an increased rear yard setback uh, to the residential properties at the rear. Uh, on the lower portion of Morris Turnpike, again, uh, we have a, a development intensity of 18 dwelling units per acre as stipulated in the settlement agreement. We again have reduced the, the maximum height down to 40, store, 40 feet or three stories. Um, we had originally in our first draft proposed four stories in this location, but we have been able to reduce that down to three, uh, given some uh, full analysis uh, as was suggested at Tuesday's meeting. So I wanna thank in particular Mr. Morreale, who I see is here, <laughs> uh, for his feedback on that. We were able to, to do that. Uh, we've also reduced that front yard setback even uh, lower, so down to just 20 feet, which is consistent with the existing building setback line in the adjacent areas along, uh, along Morris Turnpike. And then at Milburn Avenue, um, the B2 zone portion there, that's uh, uh, required to be developed at a higher intensity of 40 dwelling units per acre, given its closer proximity to the downtown area. Um, in this location, uh, we're maintaining the maximum height of 40 feet or three stories for um, non-residential development. So commercial developments uh, have to you know, respect the existing um, height limitation. Um, and we're allowing uh, an additional story and additional for, uh, height up to 48 feet um, when there's at least one story of residential development included. So a mixed use building can be up to 48 feet or four stories uh, or a solely residential building, a multifamily housing development can be 48 feet or four stories in this location. Um, and we've also modified the front yard setback here as well to 20 feet, um, which is consistent uh, with the adjacent properties uh, along Milburn Avenue. And actually it, it, the uh, existing front yard setback on the opposite side of Milburn Avenue as well. So to create that kind of consistent feel uh, on the street. Um, next, so we were asked to kind of prepare um, a site design, a proposed site design layout. So um, this property here, which doesn't technically exist, but is a model one acre uh, minimum size property, uh, which is the minimum size requirement um, for development in the lower Morris uh, Turnpike uh, area. Um, the minimum width of a lot is 150 feet. So, you know, if this property were to be developed, this is how that development would be configured. Um, so we provided, uh, you know, an ingress driveway to a rear parking area and then an egress driveway out to the street. Um, this built this three story building um, will have 10,100 square feet uh, of footprint per floor. Um, and then we'll allow for three stories of development, 18 units of housing, and then for a first floor of 5,000 square feet of retail. Uh, we're permitting a podium parking area. Uh, again, the building must be full three stories within 30 feet of the street facade. So you're allowed to podium just the rear portion. Um, and then here, this 50 foot area, this is the required uh, rear yard buffer area. So this would be the, the landscape screened area to any adjacent residential use um, to the rear. Um, so given um, you know, the configuration and how we kind of went through this calculation, uh, I have that information on the next slide to kind of detail how we got to these figures and how we were able to configure this to um, maintain the height of three stories um, and ensure uh, a, a lower intensity development impact. Um, so, you know, first we did, uh, we had to calculate the parking size. So we did, uh, we average, uh, considered about two spaces per unit. So if we had 18 units, that's 36 spaces. We considered also parking for, uh, you know, with a retail space, should this be a mixed use development site. Um, building space breakdown, you know, we have a usable area of 20, 27,360 square feet. We reserved a portion of the building area for uh, circulation, internal you know, mechanical equipment or other things. Um, and then kind of broke out, you know, how that space would be allocated uh, across the floors. 
We have an average unit size in this speculative development of 897 square feet. And we wanted to demonstrate how that's consistent with uh, you know, average unit sizes of a studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, or three bedroom unit. Um, so as we've shown here, you know, in this model calculation of a one acre site, which would be developable, we'd have an average unit size of 897 square feet, um, which is you know, just above a two bedroom unit, which would allow for a uh, nice development uh, on this property. Um, so that's kind of you know, some of the calculations and I'm happy to talk through anything that we've shared today um, and kind of you know, discuss you know, any other questions or you know, address anything else. I hope that provides a little bit of a summary overview as to where we are. Um, and again, I just wanna thank um, the participants from Tuesday uh, for their um, great feedback that we that they provided, and I, as as it shows, it, it did help us uh, kind of do a little bit of amended, uh, you know, look at this and some changes. So, great, thanks, Graham. Really appreciate that. I think at this point, then we'll just uh, we'll ask if anybody wants to answer any questions, and then once we're done with the Q and A, we'll uh, we'll we'll provide a summary of uh, how this moves forward, and um, and uh, and uh, let everybody know. So, um, okay. Again, just as a fair warning, I'm bringing everybody on as a participant so we can uh, speak a little bit more face to face. Good. Sarah, you're on. Oh, thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, and uh, first of all, also, I will say thank you to Mr. Petto. I think this is very informative. I've learned, um, I've learned a lot here. Um, are there any requirements for the separation of a development from the New Jersey transit tracks? Um, is, is there anything that would limit construction there or require a setback from the tracks or to separate it in some way? That's my first question. My second question is, how much land is available in the CMO? And does any of it um, have a proximity to the Rahway River? Sure. Um, sure, so thank you first. Thank you for both of your questions. Um, let me first flip to answer, we'll address the B2 zone and, uh, and the relationship with uh, proximity to the uh, rail right of way. Um, so the configuration of these properties, oh, hang on one second. Um, in this location along Milburn Avenue, for example, um, in this lot configuration, um, this is the rear property line for these properties. So this, this kind of line here, it would be the rear property line. So any development that occurs on either of these lots will be required to maintain a rear yard setback from that lot line. Um, and let me just pull, I wanna give you the exact specific dimension for these areas. The required rear yard setback in these locations is 50 feet. Um, so any, any new building development would have to be a minimum of 50 feet from this property line off, uh, you know, onto the site. So, you know, there is su sufficient buffer that's required, um, and that's the building setback that's required in this location. Um, in addition, you know, the real constraint that's going to happen for these properties is the provision to provide parking. You know, as we've stipulated, there is no front yard parking will not be permitted within any of this area on this lot. Uh, I hope you can see my cursor. Um, which will require parking to be more in this area, in the rear of these properties, which will provide greater separation from uh, the New Jersey Transit Rail right of way um, and further protect the, the development there. I hope that answers that first question. Um, I was concerned as to whether or not there would be any, um, I know this has come up among some residents, mm -hmm. um, maybe access from any development that occurs there to the Milburn train station, would there be something back there where a pedestrian could walk? Is, is anything like that a possibility? Or is that unrelated completely? And, you know, New Jersey Transit is not going to have any say in what goes on there. Yeah, I would say that, you know, any type of, you know, additional path would require easements, agreements, access across multiple different properties, you know, and, and sign off by multiple property owners. Um, I can tell you New Jersey Transit is not going to allow access to their property in this location to walk down. I'm not sure if the adjacent property would allow any form of walking path or access. That would be a private negotiation between those two. Um, we are not requiring that as part of the, the development process. That would be something above and beyond um, you know, the scope of, of these initial changes and something that could be contemplated um, as part of a site plan review with the board. 
Okay, thank you. That, okay. that answers that. Sure, and then, and then your question was about the CMO zone, correct? Yes, and if, if there is land that's um, adjacent to the river uh, that's available, I have no idea what's available back there. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, largely, as you can see here, um, this is a, a screen grab from our new interactive map here in the township, and you can see the building footprints of the existing buildings on the individual lots. Um, so much of the lots existing do have improvements on them. Um, there are a couple that are available and open, uh, you know, without a, a constructed building, um, but this would allow for, you know, any potential redevelopment or reuse of these properties. Um, to, you know, should they be vacant or unused uh, or, you know, the property owner be interested in redeveloping, uh, they could redevelop uh, some of these lots with uh, a residential component. Um, of course, you know, all other environmental requirements, DEP permitting, any encroachment to wetlands, flood right away, all those things are still going to be required. Um, you know, this, this zoning ordinance does not supersede any of that. Um, you know, so, so there will be a very comprehensive re review process that's required as part of any development review. I think, uh, Graham, correct me if I'm wrong, it would be very difficult to have first floor residential in this in this area due to the due to the flood zone. And given so, the flood, yeah, given the flood, uh, you know, the required um, first floor elevation, you know, probably would preclude any um, living space on the first floor, uh, would limit it to just access or amenity space uh, to get but that, that, But that doesn't necessarily preclude from a, you know, some some other use on the first floor and residential on top. That's correct. Yeah, depending on the on the location of the property and the floodplain elevation at that at that location. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Just give me one second. I'm not used to the. Uh... No worries. Okay. All right. Mike, Coop bringing you on now. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Morning. Morning. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, provide some some comments and, and questions. Um, uh, I also appreciate uh, Mr. Petto some of the adjustments that were made around the B two zone. Uh, I'm a, a resident uh, adjacent to Lower B two, okay. uh, right right behind Lot eighteen oh one. Um, so the, the changes here are obviously pretty important, um, mm -hmm. for me, uh, and my family here. Uh, so I, I think I wanted to just confirm some of the, some of what I heard, sure. um, the, the first was on the, the, some strengthened buffer requirements. So, um, if, if you can just step through that again, I'd, I'd appreciate it. And, sure. Sure. Uh, yep. Yeah, good. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it's best to, to pull up this kind of sample graphic of the site design. So, um, the, the, Buffer requirement that's existing in township code is um, 50 feet or 20% of the depth of the lot. And the landscape buffer area must be maintained along and adjacent to any residential adjacent you know, property or use. And that includes rear property line or side property line, because there is you know, variation in depth of these lots in your location at the B2 zone. Um, so there may be residential uses that abut actually the side of one of these. And we've incorporated that to ensure that it's also a buffer would be required for any side uh, as well. Um, and what we've required is the inc inclusion of a fence. Once the buffer uh, gets below 20 feet, we're requiring the inclusion of a fence of at least six feet high, a privacy fence. Um, and in addition to that, we're requiring the fence to be set back five feet where my cursor is, and then requiring this intervening space between the fence and the property line to be landscaped so that you, you know, any adjacent residential property owner is not looking at a new stark white vinyl fence, they're looking at vegetated screening. Um, we've also modified the um, minimum, the planting uh, requirements in the zone, in this area for the buffer um, to stipulate that they need to grow to a taller mature height. Um, you know, a, a height that will provide more effective screening of this building from the adjacent residential. Um, 
and again, we, we're, we're taking, we can do a little bit of that geometric look, you know, it's kind of the old school geometry of, okay, this is, this building is, you know, 40 feet tall. Um, and then you have this distance is, you know, your X, your X and Y, and you have your, <laughs> your ABC, whatever the right triangle dimensions are. Um, so we can identify the height of a planting here to ensure that it will not be visible. Um, so we're going to take a look at that to, to provide a specific dimension for mature tree height um, or planting type that will grow to that type of height. I hope that helps answer some of your questions about the buffer requirements. Appreciate that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. So on the, the setback, which I, I mm -hmm. recognize is distinct from, from the buffer, um, I believe in, at least in the, the previous version that I saw, there was a reduction of the setback from 50 to 40 feet in the lower B2 zone. Um, did, was, was that adjusted to be fit to maintain the existing 50 feet set, so, setback here? So yes, so I can expound upon that. So um, we're looking at a total you know, setback area between the front and rear of 70 feet was proposed. We had a 30 foot front yard and a 40 foot rear yard is where we were getting to. Um, but based on Mr. Morreale's comments on Tuesday um, and his uh, recommendation that we look at the existing front yard setback of the adjacent properties as you move eastward on Morris Turnpike, everything is set very close in that location. So we actually, what we did is we pulled the buildings even closer. So now we're proposing a front yard setback of just 20 feet in this location, which expands the rear yard setback um, even greater. So now the required rear yard setback is a minimum of 50 feet in this location. However, um, because we're not permitting any front yard parking, um, the parking is going to have to be in the rear of these buildings, which, you know, further pulls that building line, you know, closer to the street, because you're not able to build, you know, all the way to that 50 foot line, because you need to provide parking on site uh, for the residential units. Um, okay. So sometimes in zone, zoning, <laughs> zoning can be kind of interesting in that parking winds up controlling a lot of what happens on these properties. So, um, but we did want to respect, um, you know, the existing condition, ensure those buildings were pulled as far forward as they should be. Okay. Uh, great, great, grateful for that that adjustment. I I will share that at least for this particular lot behind us, eighteen oh one. I I know it's forty six feet, so a, a change from forty to fifty in terms of where the, the building the building is today, at least, um, you know, has some some potential implications there. Yes. Um, I I think in terms of the building height, I you know understood that you've made an adjustment there, forty eight mm -hmm. to forty feet. Um, I I think the Maybe the ask is is if there's a uh, uh, an alternative here uh, that would be two stories. Um, whether there could be a site design around what that would conceivably look like, understanding that um, to do that, maybe there would have to be another concession around moving away from multi-use. Um, I think you know the the, the as presented uh, when you when you layer on commercial with with residential, it forces the layering up and forces height. Um, and I think um, certainly um, given concerns that we have about privacy and noise and sunlight access, um, you, you know, two stories would be far more in character with, with our residential neighborhood where we have really split levels and ranchers and you don't, you don't have large buildings. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think that would be um, my question set, slash ask if there's a uh, a way to explore something uh, a a further reduction to 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 two stories so that it is more you know in character with the the surrounding Glenwood community. Sure, sure. No, thank you for the comments. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I think the the one difficulty that we have in this location is, is that the existing uh, maximum height is 40 feet and three stories. So that is the existing allowance in the zone. So a further reduction would represent. Uh, a, a greater restriction on these existing property owners. Um, the other, you know, balance tests that we have to have here is that, um, you know, these draft ordinances are subject to review as part of our settlement agreement, and we have to ensure that they are realistically developable. So we can't, you know, we have to make sure that the market will allow for development of this size and scale to be realized to deliver the affordable housing requirement for the township. Um, so, you know, we'd like to start and make sure that we're at least consistent and don't go beyond what is already permitted in these areas. So that's why we, we you know, led with, um, and that's why we've gone back to the three stories and 40 feet in height. Um, the other issue is, you know, if we come down to two stories and it's just a straight two floors of residential development, 
um, you know, it, it gets very difficult for developers to finance that type of, you know, arrangement. You know, it's difficult given the size, just 18 units in this example, um, to, to get financing to construct a building at that type, particularly in as, you know, the market is, we're seeing these fluctuations. Um, so the allowance for some, you know, additional rateable space and additional um, first floor retail leasable space um, will create conditions to allow these developments to actually be realized. Um, so, you know, it is a balancing test. I understand, you know, it, we have to be sensitive to, um, you know, the adjacent residential development. And that's why we started this off with the buffer requirements and making sure that those were strong and included, um, you know, clear requirements. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, things will be probably greater setback than the existing condition that you have now. You mentioned that the existing building is 46 feet off that rear property line. We're going up to 50 and to, you know, accommodate a parking area in that location too, it's probably going to be wind up being greater than 50. Um, so, you know, I, I understand, you know, it's, it's difficult to kind of see how, you know, uh, you know, if, if there could be further reductions, I, I understand your question. Um, but we want to make sure that the township um, is protected in its settlement agreement and, you know, demonstrates compliance with this as well. So this balance test is difficult for us to do, but, um, you know, I think that's why we did the buffer uh, requirements in, in tandem uh, with these greater setback requirements as well. So I hope that answers your question. I know it's not probably exactly what you're looking for, but, you know, we're trying to be sensitive to you all as well and, and make sure that we can find a, a balance. And, and I'll just jump in, but there's also, the, yeah, there's also... Yeah. There's also a degree of that it is a commercial zone, and we also, you know, feel that there's an importance to having that that commercial zone as well. And so, you know, we need to, you know, I think, as Graham said, it's all a balancing act, and and certainly um, having this overlay is providing an opportunity. But the existing zoning is sort of the forefront zoning, so you know, um, they just want to just kind of keep that in mind too. But I think Graham answered the question. Really. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that comment, Alex. I, I guess I would offer just the, the unique nature of the lower B2 zone from where I sit, at least. Uh, you know, we, we are, um, we're talking about a, a major thoroughfare, Morris mm -hmm. Avenue, but it is really mm -hmm. cut off from the mm -hmm. residential community. There, there isn't, there aren't roads or access points. You have to drive out of that residential community to even access those amenities. So these mm -hmm. are not necessarily amenities that are shared by actual Milburn residents, the Milburn Township residents, you know, I would just offer again, you know, the, 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 the unique uh, nature of the B2 lower zone is that you have, you know, commercial abutted right up against these single ham family homes, my, my home and my neighbor's homes, and um, increasing the, the height of these buildings is going to, um, in, in, in my judgment, increase the, the, the negative externalities of you know, decrease privacy, decrease sunlight, and, and increase to the, the the noise and trash and other variables. So, um, uh, understand the position, uh, but mm -hmm. but again, my my uh, my my request or my my recommendation is to to see if there's a way to um, continue to visit lowering that uh, that that height to to two stories. Well, well, I, I think I think yeah, and I think the larger point there too is, is that you know and and. Due to the conversation we had on Tuesday, you know, we're not increasing the height, but the, the height that that's that's currently allowed is 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 being maintained. And so, you know, the, there's nothing to preclude, a, you know, an owner there to tear down the building they have and build a build a 40 foot commercial building either. Um, so, right, right, you know, I think, right. yeah, you know, and, and, and Grant, you know, Grant, Graham has done a great job incorporating all the residents, you know, and in, input or, or at least hearing it out and seeing if there was there's any possibility. So appreciate the comments. Yeah, uh, un understood. And th this will be my last thought. I mean, and, and Alex point taken on, on maintaining the existing 40 feet. I think the differentiator is now it, it's, it's mixed use and that is a change, right? So that, that is not to, to my understanding allowed today. So, it, you know, it, it, to me, you know, the, that, that is a, a, a change in terms of the dynamic and if reducing the height is not an option, again, there's, uh, you know, I think an alternative here to allow either or rather than a both end and have this be um, uh, residential or or commercial, uh, notwithstanding the, the 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 points that that Mr. Petto uh, just made. Uh, but but I'll, I'll end there. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to to speak and and the transparency here. No, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for taking the time to provide feedback. This is what, what what helps us and helps you all in the process. So thank you for your time.
Okay. Mr. Cosgrove. Good morning, Mr. Cosgrove. Dave, you there? Oh, I'm sorry, Alex. I, I was talking a blue streak there with the mute. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to start over, Dave. So now I'm going to ask you to answer those questions. No, yeah. I'm kidding you. But uh, I, I, what I was saying was thank you both very much for putting this on. Um, so I, I do have a, a few comments, um, and I thought it might be easier, um, you know, if I just um, used as an example the, the B2 ordinance or the proposed B2 ordinance, you know, to make comments about, you know, language that's there, um, and, you know, and worries that I have. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to focus on, you know, like I said, the, um, the, the where I think it's part of it is the buffer zone, but it's, it's um, actually, I'm not really seeing the number on it yet, Alex, it's, it's just 22, but it's the B2, uh, I'm sorry, I just lost it. The B the B two it yeah. says six oh six point six highway business B yeah. two. Yes. Yeah, these are these are all drafts at this point, so there's no oh, number assigned. Gotcha. All right, so so let me go to the second page of that. There's a, a section C, which is accessory uses. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm going to talk in particular about a number to paragraph two. Um, you know, and and you know, Graham, you and I haven't, haven't met, you know, but, you know, this amenity space is an, an issue very near and dear to me mm -hmm. uh, because of what happened next to my house with, you know, under the definition or guise of amenity space. Um, but the question I have initially is you know, the way that's drafted, it says indoor and outdoor residential amenity space, and then it's semicolon. And then it says rooftop decks and rooftop amenities are prohibited. So if I'm if I'm reading that I'm unclear as to whether we are allowing an indoor and outdoor residential amenity, uh, you know, first part, and then separately we're saying we're going to prohibit the rooftop deck and the rooftop amenity as an accessory use. So, you know, just clarification on that, um, mm -hmm. and and maybe perhaps write it differently if what's happening is we're going to allow indoor and outdoor amenity space. But we're going to prohibit um, a rooftop, you know, a deck or a rooftop amenity. And then the second uh, issue uh, on the same, you know, on that second second paragraph, second phrase there, that rooftop deck and rooftop amenities. I worry about the use of that language. I'm very happy that it's being prohibited. Um, so please don't get me wrong. But I worry about that because, for instance, at the woodland project next to me. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the first of all, the you know, the the developer tried to argue they had an absolute right to two rooftop decks. At the end of the day, the planning board approved one rooftop deck, but redefined it and said it was not a rooftop deck because it was on top of the third floor of the building as opposed to on top of the third, fourth floor of the building. So it, you know, uh, this is a little bit of a smart aleck remark. It magically. <laughs> you know, became not a rooftop deck anymore. So I worry about, you know, a, a proper definition there, you know, that rooftop deck might include anything on top of a roof, even if it's one story tall, um, and then some clarification on the indoor outdoor. And then the last uh, comment I have um, is there's, in a couple of these, there's the, I'm gonna call it the exclusion um, when there's a railroad track or a public road, you know, that's adjacent to a piece of property. Um, and my only thought, and again, this, this really is nowhere near my house, you know, so it's not uh, quite as near and dear. But, you know, the, the problem I have, and again, because it happened in our area in a different context, um, is that when you take that railroad track, for instance, going through Milburn or you take Milburn Ave, uh, and you say, okay, that's going to change what happens here because there's this piece of land between a residential, for instance, the, um, you know, the area, I'm going to say, I guess, east of Annie Says, you know, down to Trader Joe's and, and all that. On the other side of the railroad tracks there, there are houses, you know, in, in areas. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when you put a four-story building there, 
Um, the railroad, you know, while it provides some protection, obviously, and some separation, it doesn't necessarily, um, you know, and again, you know, for noises, for, you know, rooftop amenities of any sort, you know, I think that's still out there. Um, and I think that affects to an extent the B2 folks as well. But, but th those are my comments. Um, so I thank you very much. No, thank you so much for your comments. Yeah, I can quickly speak to uh, some of them. Um, so your first comment regarding the um, language for the accessory uses, um, the indoor and outdoor uh, residential amenity space. So, you know, I think what we can do is kind of separate these, disconnect these two elements. So, um, you know, the, the way this language is worded, it's permitting as an accessory use indoor or outdoor residential amenity space on the site. Um, and then we've separately said that a prohibited uh, outdoor amenity space would it be rooftop decks and rooftop amenities as a prohibited accessory use. Um, we can certainly separate those two so that they're two defined uh, separate elements within this section and not nested together. Um, the second comment uh, that you had was worrying about the use of this language about the rooftop decks and rooftop amenity space. Um, as we've done previously for the township and other you know, form, forums, we've looked at uh, creating a definition for rooftop amenity space or rooftop decks. Um, we have seen some good sample language as to what defines that. And I agree with you, it should be anything that's on a rooftop, not just necessarily the topmost roof. Um, you know, anything that's a, a horizontal surface, you know, on top of, you know, surrounding walls um, is considered a roof. Um, so we can certainly look at uh, clarifying that and creating a definition to define what is a rooftop deck or a rooftop amenity space uh, and where that can be permitted or not. Um, and then uh, finally, your last comment regarding the railroad taxes and exclusion, certainly understand. I think that's a, a good comment. Um, you know, rights of way like this may not always necessarily be a good buffer or separation, but we can certainly, um, you know, be cognizant of the fact that Oh, Alex, did you have something you want to chime in on? Yeah, I was just I was just curious about this one only because, oh, yeah. you know, um, I'm 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 not sure in looking at the ordinance, is this as it relates to restaurant use or is this as it relates to the actual building? Because uh, this is what the. No, the this is not related to oh, the buffer. No, the the, the 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 railroad and the and the street being used as a as a as a or not oh, counting no, towards as as the, the nature of the question, Mr. Cosgrove's question. Yeah, yeah, I guess Mr. Cosgrove is is your question about the right of way um, or railroad? Is that specific to the buffer requirements, or is that related to separation of other uses? That would that was separation of other uses. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you. For okay. Before I went too far. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I think that that's something that's that's probably ongoing at this point as well with the with the restaurant use and, and uh, using the, the street or the railroads as a as a uh, as a as a buffer or counting not counting it towards that setback number. So, um, all right. Thank you, Mr. Cosgrove. Appreciate it. I, I had one last question, oh, sure. but, but Alex, Go you know, ahead. you can come back to me. I know there's other people on. No, there's, look, there's one other person, um, Jay, who had his, he, he, he made a bunch of comments on Tuesday. So, you know, take your time. You got All right. So, 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 so the last would be on uh, same sections, but C, paragraph C, numbered four, which talks about any other use that's subordinate or customarily incidental. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So that language, again, no, nothing wrong with the way it's written per se, but what it worries me again is that uh, a, a planner um, for a developer um, gets up before the planning board and says, um, you know, these falling uses in my humble, in my expert opinion, are subordinate uh, and customarily incidental, and then tries to, you know, uh, you know, make something up, a, a shooting range on top of the building mm. or something like that, mm. uh, because we can't really predict that. I can't either. You know, what what the next, you know, cool amenity is going to be um, that some developer wants. So, you know, maybe some language there for four that would make it clear that, you know, a, a, a planner, um, you know, can't, um, you know, or is not going to be allowed to to couch you know, a, an amenity as a subordinate customary incidental use. Thank you. That, that's it. All right. And Thanks. I it. <laughs> Appreciate the feedback. Thank you so much for taking the time this morning. Okay. 
Um, Graham, do you have any do you have any thought or comment on that? I mean, uh, you know, uh, obviously that is that is sort of the argument that was I think used uh, in the past. It's like, oh, well, it is it is uh, you know subordinate or it is a common amenity or you know, yeah, I mean, and it's hard it is hard to predict that even from you know uh, from the township's perspective to just throw in all of these different things that that might might come up. But you know, is it something where you uh, well certainly you know it can't be something that's already prohibited, right? Right. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I, Mr. Cosgrove's point is, is, you know, very good. You know, I think the intent of including the other provisions, you know, as far as suggested, you know, incidental uses, you know, as far as leasing sales management offices, others associated with residential apartments, you know, I think what we can all further define is, you know, exclusive res use by residents of the property, you know, not, you know, outside use. Um, there's other things that we can do. And typically, um, you know, by including sample provisions, that should help define any planning arguments around that. You know, so you know, the shooting right. range is not something that's customarily associated with. Uh, you well, know, right, but that, also, you know. but but also, it, you know, or or is it something that is like you know, you know, you, an amenity space is also still permitted in the zone? Type of thing. Right, right, right. So yeah, there's separate amenity spaces, and perhaps you know what we can do is we'll look at both those sections and make sure that you know even amenity spaces are you know, suggested uses as far as like a fitness room or, you know, uh, a movie room right. or snack bar right. room, you know, whatever that right. may be, but we can include those. Um, and it helps in the planning testimony and review of these applications if we provide some of those examples of amenity spaces or provide examples of what, you know, incidental uses they may be, um, because that, that can help the board define and say, well, this is what this is what this ordinance entails. And it's you're, entails way, you're way out there. You're way yeah. off base. Right, right, right. So, okay. Um, all right, great. Uh, one more. We got uh, we, uh, bringing Jay on. You're on, Jay. Morning, Jay. Good to see you again. First off, uh, I want to thank uh, both of you. Um, for, for A, holding these sessions, both the Tuesday session and session today, I think it shows a, a tremendous amount of respect um, for the residents, um, uh, especially those that are impacted by this. And, and I wanna say thank you for the changes that um, you've incorporated um, already in just two days. So it is um, A, very, very much appreciated. So, so I wanna say that up front. Um, I do have one question, kind of a, a small technicality that I did not uh, remember to ask on Tuesday. Um, the, the height requirement is listed both in feet and in stories. Um, it, it worries me, and maybe wrongfully so, that it doesn't say the maximum of one or the other. Um, and my fear, um, again, just being a very kind of suspicious person um, that I am, is that uh, uh, somebody will come in and say, listen, um, uh, we're building luxury apartments here. We need 15 foot high ceilings and this, that, and the other thing. And before you know it, you got a 55 foot tall building. So if, if there's a, A, if you could, I don't know if it makes sense to remove it or just state the maximum of one or the other. Um, I think that would, uh, but you know, these rules and how they're interpreted better than I, maybe it's a misplaced concern, but um, uh, that's just a net that um, maybe you can comment on. Yeah, um, certainly. My, and, and again, so I can do that first one or yeah, go ahead. Okay, sure. Um, so, uh, the maximum uh, height and stories that is, uh, it's, it's a requirement for both conditions to be met, it's not a one or the other. Okay. Um, so you know, it if they're proposing two stories and the height is, is 40 feet, then it can be two stories with two 20 foot stories if they want. If they want to squeeze four, st four short stories <laughs> in 40 feet, they, can, they can't do that because okay. it's gotta be three stories. So um, it, is, it is both requirements that apply. So, so it's not, so not a pick it, or choose. Okay, so it is an and condition as Correct. we would say in the technology world. Yeah, and the definition of story and the definition of how to measure a building height are both provided in the ordinance in the definition section. So. Fantastic, that's great. Um, uh, 
I will sort of echo uh, uh, Mr. Shepard's point, Mike Shepard's point on the one or the other, um, not the multi-use. Uh, and and um, I, I just, I don't see that it, um, it point you know taken on um, getting financing uh, for these buildings. That being said, um, on the days when I used to ride the train into Manhattan, I've seen an awful lot of buildings go up uh, along the tracks that are purely residential. Um, and, and now I realize our downtown building is a different class because it's being funded differently, et cetera. So I can't point to that and say, look, you got 100% affordable, it's um, uh, residential. But it, if you do go, you know, just a little bit further down um, Route 124, which is Morris Turnpike, you know, to, to just past the wine library on the right, you'll see two-story apartments. Um, and I'll grant you they were built at a different time and mm -hmm. in a different era. <laughs> Uh, but but I do I do want to um, say I'm I'm still sort of supporting um, the notion of one or the other. Um, I will also point out for reference that um, the buildings um, in the 1801 space today are all one story. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, moving to three stories is a, it, it, well. And again, I will acknowledge that it is 40 feet as uh, you pointed out today, and they could do that today. Um, I, will, I will also point out if you go down, I, if you go the other direction um, and look at the uh, Short Hill side of Route 124, um, you will not find a three-story building adjacent to residential as you go, um, I guess that's uh, uh, west. Uh, you will not find a, a three-story commercial building um, along that route until you get past the King's building. And even those, the, the ones that are bigger than, that are even three stories don't abut residential. So, so that's my comment there. Um, you did bring up something though that I thought um, uh, I, I did want, knew, um, and that is in terms of combination of mixed uses. Um, and this goes, this will go back to uh, our discussions of last year. But um, one thing that if you put in a consideration of, of prohibiting mixed use restaurant and residential, um, I know that would um, uh, be viewed as a, a very, very positive sign by um, all of the residents um, along the 1801 block there. So something that uh, you may want to take away and give a thank on. So, uh, and, and I got it and, and listen, I don't have any data on this and, and I haven't done any research, um, but I, I, I would, would, if you believe that residential above a restaurant is more desirable, and residential, 100% res residential, um, it, it, please pass along any, any analysis or data that you have to, to show that because um, my gut tells me, um, and, and I don't wanna speak for every renter uh, that's out there, but my gut tells me um, that most renters would, given the choice of living above a restaurant that's open to one in the morning with, with you know, about music and, and patrons coming in and out and parking behind their apartments, given the choice between that and having a 100% residential, um, my guess is you're going to have a lot better luck filling a 100% residential. But again, I could be wrong on that. There may be studies out there that say people love living above restaurants. Um, I just, uh, I, I see Alex smirking, but I- Well, I'm, I'm just saying, I, you know, I guess it, one, it depends on the restaurant. It depends on, you know, the age of the people. It, yeah, I'm sure there's a whole host of factors that go into that. It's well. I, I well then then find find me a study because I've looked a little bit and I couldn't. Now on the other hand, I couldn't find anything that said it's it's the opposite either. I'm right. wrong with you. So I'm I'm not trying to, to yeah. paint the picture, but I'm telling you what my gut feels. Well, you know, the only thing I'll say, Jay, is that certainly one thing is, is that you know we recorded today's session because we knew we were going to go over last uh, on Tuesday's information. 
Um, you know, you had, you had made this uh, similar point uh, on Tuesday, which I think is, you know, a, is a fair point and, and uh, something that can be evaluated. Now our job is to incorporate the comments and understand, you know, what the residents have brought forward and get that to the township committee so that they can, um, you know, sort of go through their policy making process. This recording will be um, provided to them as well, so that they can, you know, take the time if they if they if they choose to go through it or whatever. Um, and certain these larger points that that everybody has made, we'll make them aware. Um, and and it can be a you know a, sort of a, a, a policy decision on their end if they say, hey, look, we, we agree, maybe it should be one or the other. But mm -hmm. you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a fair it's a fair point that you and Mike have made. But I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of different considerations and and certainly, you know, I understand from your perspective and, and living behind that and what that is. And then, you know, uh, and then, um, you know, the committee will have to sort of look at it from from uh, from all those perspectives. But appreciate pr definitely appreciate all the time you've put into this and and the comments you've made and and uh, and, the, and the sort of the betterment you've made on on this uh, on this these ordinances. So. Yeah and, yeah, and again, thanks to both you guys for a holding these sessions and um, the changes that you've already incorporated are very much appreciated. So I don't want that point to uh, not be heard. <laughs> yeah, Great. thank you so much. Yeah, and we can take a look at some of the combination of use uh, research and, and share that with you too, Jay. So mm -hmm. you no, know, and then just to uh, Alex's point again, thank you uh, for all your time on this. You've definitely made these ordinances better. So and I'm I'm, I'm appreciative of this whole process has made it yep. made things yep. a better outcome. I think. So. And the offer's still out if you want to take a walk back there. Happy to uh, uh, show it to you and give you a little bit of the history. I, as I mentioned, I'll probably be by tomorrow before uh, I head over for another meeting in town hall. So I'll see You're you. The best. <laughs> Thank both of you guys. All right. All right. Thanks, Thank Jay. Um, okay. Uh, that's. Uh, that's it. That's what we got. Um, I, uh, again, appreciate everybody's time. Really appreciate Graham's, you know, uh, insight and understanding of these, uh, these issues and putting the ordinances together at this point. Now, uh, we've, 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 we've gone through this process. We're going to share these, this information, the, the modifications and changes to the township committee so that they can get, uh, started on the, uh, the rulemaking, so to speak. Uh, this will probably be in front of the township committee, either on the 17th or on the June 7th meeting um, for, for uh, discussion or introduction. We'll keep the public obviously aware of that, uh, but just wanted everybody to know the timing, you know, the idea is that we get these introduced um, prior to the township's compliance hearing with, uh, with fair share housing. So a uh, couple steps to go through yet, but, um, but uh, we'll be moving these forward and I just really appreciate everybody's input. So. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.